All right, cool. Uh, welcome back. Uh, so this is the first talk of the afternoon session. Uh, we're going to hear about uh, more exciting results on uh, simplifying uh, um, IO constructions. And uh, the talk will be given by Prabhanjan. This is joint work with uh, Amit Sahai. Um, thanks, Alejandro. Can you hear me? OK. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about new constructions of uh, IO from constant degree and maps. And this is joint work with Amit. So in this work, we are going to propose a new template to construct uh, IO from constant degree maps. Uh, in order to say what is new about this, first let's uh, revisit the prior known uh, templates uh, by Rachel and uh, another work by Rachel and Vinod. So they start with constant degree maps and they construct uh, collision resistant FE for Boolean circuits. And uh, then they uh, use bootstrapping mechanisms to go from this to uh, indistinguishability obfuscation. Uh, there are a couple of remarks about the first step. So the MMAP computations are in general performed over large fields. So in order to construct FE for Boolean circuits from MMAPs, uh, it's sort of necessary to arithmetize these Boolean circuits. Right? Uh, and in this work, we uh, sort of replace this FE for Boolean circuits with uh, uh, what we call projective arithmetic FE for arithmetic circuits. You can really think of this uh, PAFE scheme as being a version of uh, function encryption for arithmetic circuits. Uh, I'm going to define this uh, notion more formally later. And once we construct this notion of PAFE for arithmetic circuits, we show how to obtain I.O. from this. Okay, so let me lay out the template in more detail. So as I said, we construct the notion of PAFE. And we construct uh, PAFE for degree D polynomials from degree D M maps. The D here is the same. Oh, I can use this. Uh, the degree D, sorry, degree D here is the same. Uh, and in the second step, we show how to construct uh, IO from PAFE for degree D polynomials and degree D randomizing polynomials. Again, the D here is the same. And this is important. So this is sort of a degree preserving uh, transformation. And uh, there are a few remarks about the second step. First is that uh, the notion of randomizing polynomials is, uh, also needs to satisfy some additional properties, um, which is slightly non-standard, but uh, uh, such randomizing polynomials can be constructed from known schemes. I'm going to mention what are these additional properties later. And in this step, uh, we don't use any uh, maps, so the maps only comes in the first step. And uh, one thing I omitted is that this step involves additional assumptions, but uh, there are standard uh, assumptions such as learning with errors and so on. And another thing is that this security loss in the step is sub-exponential, and uh, this is sort of uh, also the case uh, with the prior works. Okay. So uh, once you plug in the appropriate degree D randomizing polynomials in this transformation, we get IO from 15 degree M maps, 12, and 7, okay? And uh, the 12 and 15 are essentially very similar uh, uh, constructions of randomizing polynomials, and degree 7 M map is a, is a different construction of randomizing polynomial. Again, I'm omitting some additional standard assumptions being used in this step, okay? So this is, uh, these are our results. And uh, as Rachel mentioned, the prior, uh, the, the degree of M maps used in prior works was at least 32. Okay. Okay. So let me define this notion of projective arithmetic FE. So recall that we want some version of function encryption tailored to uh, the setting of arithmetic circuits. Right? So let, let's try to uh, define this notion. The a first attempt would be to just take the notion of uh, functional encryption that is defined for Boolean circuits, but instead now you can represent the, you can associate the functional keys with arithmetic circuits. Right? The problem with this, uh, so before I explain the problem, so uh, just to explain this uh, first attempt in more detail, uh, if you have a ciphertext of X and a functional key associated with a polynomial P, then the decryption should yield the output of the polynomial on this input. Okay? So this is what I mean by uh, if you for arithmetic circuits. Okay. okay, so the problem with this uh, notion is that this is too strong to achieve. And why is that? Uh, so if the P of X we require is too large, 
then we cannot use current known techniques to achieve this. Uh, the field is too large, exactly. Yes. We also have to ultimately construct this notion right. It's not impossible. It's just that it's we don't know how to construct that. That's all I'm saying, right? Yeah. Okay. And the, in order to see why this is the case, uh, if you look at uh, inner product function encryption schemes, for example, the output of the function is available as an exponent in a group. And the only way to recover this is to perform discrete log. And again, you can only perform discrete log if this exponent is very, very small. So if you're working over a large field, you cannot do this. So again, by the notion being too strong, I mean that we don't know how to achieve it. There's nothing wrong in defining this notion. Okay. Did you try to see whether it implies the same schemes? Or? Uh, we... Um, we well, can still formulate it and see. We can, we can formulate it and see, and I think it might... Uh, um, no, no, it is in, I mean, general functional encryption does imply it as a special case as long as it's sufficiently repeatable, right? So it's not like... No, but, possible. no, it, the, the question is, again, so if you have, uh, let's say you define this notion, but if you consider for specific degree polynomials, right, then, like, for instance, Fe for uh, degree three polynomials, would it imply you? I mean, we don't know. It could be the case, right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, that we don't know. We haven't thought about it. Okay, so uh, let me define this notion. So there is an encryption algorithm that takes as input uh, message X and outputs a ciphertext. There's a key generation algorithm that takes as input a polynomial, P1, and, uh, oh, sorry, and it outputs a functional key associated with P1. And there is a decrypt algorithm that combines the functional key as well as the ciphertext to obtain an encoding of the output. So P1 of X is available in encoded, encoded form. Okay. So now if you do this uh, projective decryption multiple times with respect to different, uh, uh, different polynomials, P2, P3, and so on, you get different encodings of P1 of X, P2 of X, and so on. And then there is a recover algorithm that can recover a linear function of uh, P1 of X, P2 of X, P3 of X, as long as the output of this linear function is small. So this is the high-level uh, high level description of the scheme. So let me uh, formally define this. Uh, here, for this talk, I'm going to just focus on the secret key setting. So the setup algorithm outputs the master secret key. And there is an encryption algorithm, key generation algorithm. And there is a projective decryption algorithm that combines the ciphertext and the functional key obtained uh, to obtain an encoding of the output of the polynomial on this uh, message. Okay. And there's a recover algorithm that takes as input uh, uh, these different encodings of the output of the polynomials, and as well as the coefficients uh, c1 to cn. Uh, I mean, all this will belong to the same field. Uh, and then it uh, outputs a linear combination of uh, all these uh, outputs of the polynomials, as long as this linear combination is small. If the linear combination is not small, then there is no correctness guarantee. Okay. okay. So let me define an efficiency guarantee that we are going to use. So we are going to define what is called linear overhead property. Uh, so we require that the size of the ciphertext should be uh, the size of the message times the polynomial in the security parameter. So in Rachel's talk, there was a similar such notion defined for Fe for NC0, but there they required the size of the encryption to be size of the circuit times polynomial in the security parameter. Okay. Here it's constant, yeah. So okay. Uh, so this is the efficiency property we are going to use. Um, in terms of security, we are going to define what is called semi functional security. So in order to define the security, we are going to use two auxiliary algorithms. Um, each auxiliary algorithm will be associated with the functional keys and the ciphertext. Okay? So let me first talk about the semi-functional key generation algorithm. Uh, this takes as input 
a polynomial p1 and a value v. This value v will belong to a field associated with the scheme and it outputs a functional key corresponding to this polynomial and value. <coughs> so what is the property that we require? Require that if you can combine this functional key and a ciphertext of x, then you get an encoding of p1 of x. In other words, this key behaves like an honestly generated key if you combine this with an honestly generated ciphertext. So what is the security property we require? We require that a semi-functional key is indistinguishable from an honestly generated key and this should hold even if I additionally give you honestly generated functional keys, even semi-functional keys and uh, ciphertext generated according to the description of the scheme. Okay. So this is the security property we require. Okay. So let me now talk about the second auxiliary algorithm which is the semi-functional encryption algorithm. So this takes as input the, just the size of the message and produces a fake ciphertext. Okay. And the property we require is that if you combine this fake ciphertext with a semi-functional key associated with the value v, then you get an encoding of v. Okay. So there is no, uh, I'm not going to talk about what will happen if you can combine the fake ciphertext with an honestly generated key. Okay. So there's no guarantee there. And the security you require is that a semi-functional ciphertext should be indistinguishable from an honestly generated ciphertext. And in this experiment, the adversary is only given semi-functional keys of the form uh, uh, skp, v such that v is equal to p of x. Okay? So he's only given semi-functional keys. And in addition, he can also be given honestly generated ciphertext. Okay? So these two are the properties. Uh, these two are the security properties associated with the scheme. Okay, so the only table you have to remember here is that if you combine honest uh, ciphertext and honest key, you get the correct output. You'll also get the correct output if you combine honest ciphertext and uh, semi-functional <coughs> key. If you try to combine fake ciphertext with uh, honestly generated key, then it doesn't work. Excuse me. Uh, but if you try to combine the semi-functional ciphertext with semi-functional key, then you get this hardwired value V. This is the uh, only table you have to remember. Okay. So now let's see how to construct uh, I.O. from PAFE. So in case you missed the morning session, uh, indistinguishability obfuscation is just a circuit compiler that takes us and put a circuit and spits out another circuit, such that uh, the circuit that is output by this obfuscation algorithm is functionally equivalent with the original circuit. And the security guarantee is that if I give you two functionally equivalent circuits that are also of the same size, then the, their obfuscations are computationally indistinguishable. Okay. okay, so now let's see how to construct uh, I.O. from PFE. Uh, so the approach is to uh, construct sublinear secret KFE. And uh, we require this to be sub-exponentially secure in order to get I.O. And uh, as you saw in the first talk, uh, you can actually get I.O. from sub-exponentially secure sublinear FE and uh, sub-exponentially secure LFB. I mean, in the first talk, uh, he only spoke about collision resistant uh, uh, secret key FE, but the same transformation can also be adapted to uh, get I.O. from sublinear FE. Okay. So in order to, before I move ahead, let me uh, briefly recall what is uh, sublinear secret KFE. Um, most of you are already familiar with this. So there is an encryption and a key generation algorithm says that if you can, if you combine a functional key associated with the circuit C with the ciphertext, uh, you obtain the output of this circuit in the clear. And the efficiency property we require is that of sublinearity, which says that the encryption complexity should be sublinear in the size of the circuit okay. for which you are issuing uh, functional keys. And the security is uh, the same as that of any functional encryption scheme. Uh, I'm not going to define this uh, in detail here. Okay. So, uh, since we know that sublinear FE implies IO, so our task is to just construct sublinear secret key FE. And the tools we are going to use is uh, PAFE and randomizing polynomials. 
And since I defined PAFE, let me now define what are randomizing polynomials. Uh, randomizing polynomials, uh, there's a setup algorithm that outputs a secret key. And there's an encode algorithm that takes as input a circuit and outputs polynomials P1 to Pn. Now a randomizing polynomial of uh, circuit C and input X uh, will just be uh, the output of these polynomials on X comma R, where R is the randomness uh, freshly sampled in this encoding algorithm. And there's a decoding procedure that takes as input the output of all these polynomials and uh, output C of x. Okay, so uh, I did say that we require some additional properties, so let me just focus on the additional properties that we require. So the first property we require is that of sublinear randomness complexity. So we require that the size of the randomness is sublinear in the size of the circuit. At first, you might think that this is, uh, if you're familiar with randomizing polynomials, you might think that this is non-standard, but this is very easy to achieve if you use PLGs. Okay, so this property is not that hard to achieve. So the second property is what we call composable linear decoder. So we assume that the decoding is composed of many, many linear functions, f1 to fm. And uh, require that the output of every of these linear functions is either small. If it is not small, then we interpret the output of this linear function as being null. <coughs> Furthermore, we require that each of these uh, linear functions are chosen adaptively. So the ith linear function is chosen as a function of uh, the outputs of all the previous linear functions. So if you're familiar with information theoretic chaos garble circuits, uh, they already satisfy this notion. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how to construct this sublinear FE scheme. So the setup algorithm will just execute the setup of both PAFE and randomizing polynomial scheme, and it outputs both the secret keys. So the key generation algorithm of a circuit C uh, works as follows. It first computes a randomized encoding of, uh, of C to obtain polynomials P1 to Pn. And then you compute a PFE functional key for each of these polynomials. Okay? So, and the collection of all these polynomials will just be the functional key associated with the circuit C. So let's see how to encrypt a message X. So you sample randomness R, and then you just compute a PAFE encryption of X comma R. Okay, so just this is the encryption. Okay, so let's see how to decrypt. So the decryption works as follows. So functional key associated with this, with the circuit C is essentially composed of all these PAFE functional keys, right? So you first, take the PAFE ciphertext of x comma r, you apply projective decrypt algorithm to get uh, the encodings of P1 of x comma r, P2 of x comma r, P3 of x comma r, and so on. Note that you still cannot recover all of them directly, but what you can do is you can homomorphically execute the composable linear decoder algorithm on all these encodings. And you can do that because uh, the the composable linear decoder is just, uh, outputs just the linear functions f1 to fm, and the recover algorithm of the PFE scheme allows you to homomorphically evaluate linear functions on the encodings. Okay, so this is how decryption works. Okay, okay so let's now try to argue uh, uh, the efficiency and the security properties. Let me first talk about sublinearity properties. Okay? So recall that the encryption algorithm was this. So if you look at the ciphertext, the size of the ciphertext is essentially the size of uh, the message times the polynomial of the security parameter, right? And this is just from the linear overhead property of the PAFE scheme. Furthermore, the size of the randomness is sublinear in the size of the circuit, right? And <coughs> this follows from the sublinear randomness property of the randomizing polynomial scheme. Combining both, we get 
the encryption complexity to be uh, subleaf in the circuit size. Okay. Let's see how to argue security. Let me consider the most basic case, which is that there's only one ciphertext and one functional key. Okay. Uh, what you have to show is encryption of x0 is indistinguishable from encryption of x1. Even if I give you a functional key of c, such that c of x0 is equal to c of x1. Okay. Note that the functional key of c is composed of all these uh, PAP functional keys. Okay. okay, so let's start with the first hybrid when you have uh, encryption of x0 and so on. In the first step, you invoke the security of some functional keys to actually replace each of these honestly generated uh, functional keys with some functional keys. Yeah. And the value vi associated with the ith PAFE functional key will be set to pi of uh, x0, where pi is the ith polynomial associated with the randomizing polynomial scheme. And then using the security of semi-functional ciphertext, you turn the honestly generated ciphertext with a fake ciphertext. And again, you can do that because this condition is satisfied. And once you do that, now you can replace uh, the output of the randomizing polynomial in, polynomials on x0 with the uh, output of the randomizing polynomials on x1. This just follows from the security of randomizing polynomial scheme. And then you can turn the ciphertext from semi-functional to honestly generated, but this time you use uh, x1 to encrypt. And then you can turn the functional keys to be honestly generated, okay? And the security just follows, okay? Okay, so now we have shown how to construct sublinear FE from PAFE and randomizing polynomials. So let's focus on constructing PAFE, okay? Uh, in order to construct PFE, we are first going to construct PFE from composite order and maps, and we are going to focus on asymmetric setting. And then we are going to show how to emulate composite order and maps from prime order and maps. Um, I'm, I won't have time to talk about it, but uh, if you're f familiar with bilinear literature, bilinear maps literature, then there is a way of emulating composite order bilinear maps from prime order and maps, prime order bilinear maps. And uh, they do this using dual vector spaces. So in order to adapt this for, uh, for the case of constant degree maps, we use a tensored version of dual vector spaces. Yeah, so if you're interested, we can talk after this, uh, after my talk. Okay, but the fine. This doesn't increase the degree of multi no. What, why, why, why is this? Why not just stay uh, well, there were constructions which went from composite to prime order, so we want to have constructions in both. Yeah, I guess. There's no specific reason. Um, yeah, GGH is one example. But the final construction is in uh, prime order and maps. Sorry, what did you say? Can you say So if you want to base it on GGH, for instance, like that's what Amit was suggesting, like then you need to based on prime order. There's also, you have a paper where you do yeah, composite, you composite com well, but this way you have like two different constructions. Right? <clears throat> okay, so let me first uh, briefly call the composite order functionality, right? So there is a universe set um, which has elements one to D. Uh, D is constant here, just as in the case of uh, Rachel's talk. And the elements will be encoded under subsets of uh, this universe set. And uh, we're going to denote the encoding of A1 to AQ under a set S as uh, with this notation. Okay. You essentially put each AI in a slot. Okay. So how do you perform arithmetic? So in order to add two encodings, uh, you essentially do component-wise addition. Okay. That, that's, how, that's what composite order and maps uh, offer. So when, when you pair two encodings corresponding to sets S and T, um, I should mention that S and T are disjoint, then you get an element in the set S union T. And again, the multiplication is done component wise. And uh, if you do zero test on the encoding, um, uh, with, 
at the final level, which, is, which corresponds to the universe set, then you get zero if and only if every element in these component is, in these components are zero. Okay, so let me briefly explain the intuition of this construction. Uh, this is going to be a very simple construction, so uh, uh, every one of you can follow. So we are going to closely follow uh, the construction of uh, uh, Benny and Zwicka and also concurrently observed by Zimmerman. So we are going to just restrict uh, to three slots. And uh, in the first slot, we'll have the actual computation. In the second slot will be the authentication slot, which, uh, which was similar to what was uh, employed earlier. And the third slot will be used for hardwiring stuff. Okay? So th these, uh, these, are the functionality of, these are the functionalities of uh, these three slots. Okay? okay, so let's see the construction. So as I said, this is the universe set we are going to use. And we are going to set D to be the degree of the polynomial. We are, as part of the setup phase, we are going to sample random values r and ti comma j, where i goes from one to n. n will be a function of the size of the uh, polynomial. Yeah. Um, and j will, be, will go from one to t. Yeah. So in order to generate a key for p, uh, the, the key is very simple. You have the polynomial p in the clear. In addition, you just give one encoding. Uh, the first element in this encoding is zero. The second element is the output of this polynomial on these random values, t, i, j. Yeah. And the third uh, element is again zero. This is encoded in a set uh, which is essentially the universe set, but the d element is missing. Okay. Uh, by the way, I should mention that this is a template. The actual construction has more details, but this should suffice uh, for you to understand. So in order to encrypt uh, message X, what you do is you do bitwise encryption of X. Uh, the first slot will contain the actual uh, bit of the message. The second slot will contain R times Tij, where I here is the same as this I. And you do this for all possible J, going from one to D. In addition, you also give an element zero, R, and zero. And this is encoded under the set D. And that's it, this is the ciphertext. So now, if you combine both of them, what will happen? Right? First, what you can do is you can essentially homomorphically evaluate the polynomial P on these encodings. Right? And you get the encoding P of Xi in the first slot. Right? In the second slot, you get R times P of Ti comma J. Okay? And uh, in the third slot, you'll still have zero. And if you try to combine this one and this element, this, this element, and this element, then you end up with an encoding 0 r, uh, r times p of ti comma j and 0. And this will be again under the universe set. So both these encodings are under the universe set. Um, you can essentially subtract both of them, and you'll end up with uh, p of x in the first slot, 0 in the second slot, and 0 in the third slot. Okay, That's it. This will be the output of the partial decrypt algorithm. Now you can perform uh, linear functions on these encodings. So I won't talk about uh, this in more detail. Uh, so I just men will mention two points. The first is that it satisfies linear overhead property. Why? Because you are encrypting the message bit by bit. So. Second is that security will be proven in the general group model. Uh, this is one advantage of uh, the previous work where they showed the security of the construction based on a nice looking assumption. Okay, just to summarize, we start with constant degree M maps, we construct projective arithmetic FE, we combine this and randomizing polynomials to get sublinear secret key FE. So the degree of this and this are the same. And then using this uh, previous transformations, you get IO. And what is left is to instantiate this randomizing polynomials, right? So uh, I showed some numbers in the beginning. How did I get it? Okay. okay. So in order to instantiate this randomizing polynomials, we are going to use information theory tau, 
And as I had mentioned earlier, this is a good candidate because it already has this linear decoder property. Okay, so let me roughly describe how uh, the construction works. Uh, the first phase involves computing the wire keys, right? So since we want the sublinear randomness complexities, we compute the wire keys using PRGs. Okay? And we are going to use PRGs of poly stretch. And in particular, we use Goldrex PRG. Uh, so if you want an algebraic PRG, then that has degree two. But if you want Boolean PRG, then that has degree five. Depending, this also is a function of what stretch you want. Uh, the stretch I am considering here is 1.49. N, N to N power 1.49. Oh, the, no, it, we just needed it to be more than one. It doesn't matter, it's, yeah. Uh, the second phase, we compute the garbled table. Um, every entry in the garbled table is a linear function of wire keys, so the degree is still the same. No, it, nothing changed. The third phase, we have to permute the garbled table. This is where the problem lies. I mean, the question is how do we implement this phase in low degree? Right? And there are two approaches. Uh, the first approach is to assign random masks to every wire key. And this was already done in a previous work of uh, uh, Benny, Yuval, and uh, Eyal in 2006. I'm not going to explain how to implement this, but instead I will explain how uh, computing this contributes to the degree. Okay, so every entry in the garbled table will be a function of the mask associated with both the input wires and the output wire. And unfortunately, we want all these masks to be of Boolean values. And so we have to use Boolean PRGs. And this is the reason why we get degree 15, because there are three values and we have to, uh, uh, we have to use a Boolean PRG of degree five for each one of them, and that's how we end up with 15. So the question is, uh, can we reduce the degree further? It so happens that you can actually replace one of these, uh, the computation of one of these masks with an algebraic uh, PRG, and uh, you end up with two times the degree of Boolean PRG, which is 10, and algebraic PRG of degree two, and you'll get 12. Okay, uh, there's another approach which is to sort of emulate this permutation by using uh, inner product FE schemes. Um, so, uh, so the whole idea of permutation is that you don't want the adversary to know which entry in the garbled table was decrypted. Right? So one way to achieve is to sort of have a functional encryption scheme which computes on the entire garbled table and gives you the wire key which is being decrypted. So this sort of emulates the role of permutation. Okay, so how do we do this? We have this garbled table. We sort of do a double encryption of the inner product FE scheme. Okay. And then uh, this would take as input uh, an FE key corresponding to the first wire, which is associated with bit P0. It will also take as input uh, an FE key corresponding to uh, bit P1. And then you sort of, uh, uh, execute both these keys on this double encryption to recover a FE key for the output wire that is associated with the output of the gate. Okay? And you keep on doing this. And uh, it turns out that here too we need a Boolean PRG uh, and we need uh, degree one for this, degree one for this, and so we'll end up with degree seven. Okay? So um, that's, uh, that's how we end up with all these uh, weird numbers. So the question is, can you reduce the degree below seven? Rachel already did that. Uh, but the thing is that it seems that degree five is the minimum we have to go if you have to use Boolean PRGs. Because uh, there are negative results that show that you cannot get a uh, degree below five for Boolean PRGs. So one could hope to use uh, you know, algebraic PRGs. But the main bottleneck in using algebraic PRGs is this problem of trying to decode the output of PRGs. This is not possible if, uh, if you have to use algebraic PRGs. So with that, I'll uh, end this talk. Thank you. Questions? Just go back to the previous slide for a second. Oh, sure. So the reason you can't decode it is because, again, the, the, the field is too big. <coughs> 
the field is too big, and if you have like a top level encoding of a large element, how do you well, recover? What if, uh, we were just talking about this in the break. What, what if you use a mid, uh, like a polynomial size field? What's the oh, then, then you will be able to recover as long as you give uh, encodings of all these elements in the top level. Right. Yeah. So why, why wouldn't that get you below five? But polynomial field would not suffice. Yeah. It won't work. Yeah. There, there's a compatibility issue with what field is being computed by maps. But also, like that original projective, uh, so instead if you had an arithmetic FP? Yeah, so th it could be possible to have lower degree, but we have no idea of how to construct such a scheme. Yeah. So that, that, would, that would not run into this issue of decoding uh, over large fields? Right? Yeah, it because it automatically gives you decoding of knots. So yeah.